This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. All right. Uh, my name is Cristina Mora, and I'm an assistant professor in the sociology department here at Berkeley. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second panel of the day, Politics and Social Development in Cuba. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers for you this afternoon. Uh, in order, there'll be Catherine Gordy, assistant professor of political science at San Francisco State University. Arturo Lopez Levy, research associate at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. And Wayne Smith, senior fellow and director of, Q of the Cuba program at the Center for International Policy. But before we move on to the speakers that we have here today, um, what we'll do, however, is play taped commentary. Our friend Rafael Hernandez, who many of you might know as a publisher and editor of Temas Magazine, unfortunately could not be with us here today. His visa was simply not issued on time by the US State Department for this conference. And while we're disheartened, uh, by the series of events, we did think that it was incredibly important for his comments to be heard here today. And so Rafael kindly agreed to videotape his, com his comments earlier this week, and we'll kick off the panel nonetheless with his commentary. I should warn you that the video quality leaves much to be desired. <laughs> But it does get better throughout. And nonetheless, what's most important is that we have his presence here in some way or another. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this invitation. We are at the sixth floor, than this. Sixth floor of the Film Institute, uh, uh, very close to our office in, here in, in Havana, uh, the office of uh, Revista Temas. This is the last issue of Temas which is focused on democracy and society. Uh, I am sorry I could not take <coughs> some copies with me to San Francisco. Well, uh, the subject of my presentation uh, will be uh, the political side, the political dimension of changes, of the transition, the politics of transition uh, and um, the main idea I would like to stress first is that these are sometimes, many times, considered changes, economic changes, and I want to emphasize the political changes. I want to emphasize the political implications and the political nature of the transition, of the changes today. Uh, to do that, I would like uh, to basically consider uh, three main topics. One, uh, the political common sense about Cuba, which is basically the accepted truth uh, that are considered, that are basically shared by, by many outside and also inside Cuba about the transition. I would like just to list this accepted truth that to me should be critically discussed. The second uh, topic will be uh, the political issues. Uh, the political issues of the transition, uh, in the transition agenda, mainly problems and policies. And finally, if I have time, I would like to uh, discuss uh, and to present a few uh, data about the power structure and the leadership. Well, number one, what, are, what is this common sense about Cuba, this political common sense about Cuba? I would like to list 13 truths, accepted truths, that are not questioned, that are not discussed, that are accepted as a common wisdom. Uh, number one, nothing political has changed under Raul Castro. These are only economic changes. Uh, number two, Raúl Castro is the end of the line. Uh, there's no political succession. 
I am going to show with the data that there, are, there, there is a political association right there. Number three, the key institution in the new uh, model, uh, in, the, in, in the new government, excuse me, is the military. Uh, number three, any dissent is prohibited and punished. Uh, five, political opposition groups, dissidents, are a democratic alternative as opposed to the totalitarian nature of the regime. Uh, number six, national political mediation and reconciliation is taking place led by the Catholic Church. Number seven, as long as the one-party system remains, uh, any democratic changes, any democratization is meaningless. Number eight, Cubans are isolated. They don't know what is going on in the rest of the world. Number nine, the youth want to leave. Number 10, average real income of Cubans, of Cubans, income, not salaries, income, average real income is $20. Uh, Cuban immigrants are exiles. Uh, number uh, 12, US Cuban policy is driven by a powerful force called the Cuban American lobby. And 13, as a second generation of Cuban Americans come to age, the Cuban American political lead is changing. It's changing in its uh, ideological and political uh, characteristic nature. Well, I, I, I would love to have the time to discuss all this accepted truth, uh, but I can't. Political issues in the transition agenda. I would like to, po to point out seven main uh, stumbling blocks in the transition. Number one, hyper-centralization. Number two, a state-centered socialist model. Number three, declining political participation. Number four, hyper-bureaucracy. Number five, increased economic inequality and poverty. Number six, old-fashioned media and social communication system. And number seven, weak social control and rule of law. If we consider these problems, most of these problems, if not all these problems, are not exactly economic problems. And these are the problems that have been targeted by the main political documents, by the main political programs in Cuba, mainly by the economic guidelines. What are the policies that are going to cope with these problems? Well, uh, consequently, decentralize the system, uh, de uh, expand the non-state sector, so de-estatize de the, the system, expand the non-state sector, downsize the bureaucracy, and finally restore administrative control and the rule of law. Again, are these economic policies? Well, let me, let me say a few words about the, uh, the Cuban leadership. Uh, the common wisdom is that the Cuban leadership is basically the same. We have now Raul Castro, and Raul Castro and Fidel Castro is more or less the same thing, uh, according to that uh, logic. Uh, nevertheless, if we get closer to the, to the, to the information available about uh, the, the, the political structures in Cuba, we will find that there are very interesting new data. Uh, and I would like to share with you that, uh, that, uh, that. basically I, I am going to consider like the main political power structures in Cuba, the Politburo, the political uh, bureau of the Communist Party, the Secretariat of the Central Committee, the Central Committee of the Communist Party, number three, number four, the Council of Ministers, uh, number five, the Council of the State, number six, 
the Provincial Communist Party leadership, the, the, the general secretaries, the first secretaries of the Communist Party in each one, in, in every one, in every province, uh, in each one uh, of these 15 provinces we have now. And finally, the National Assembly of the Popular Power. I'm going to, to, to keep this, uh, this list here. I'm going now to, to uh, describe uh, statistically what are basically the professional profile, uh, the age, the gender, and the skin color of uh, the members of these political structures. Number one, the Politburo. The Politburo uh, members are 14. 50% of them are military. Uh, four are engineers, two are economists, and there's one doctor and one, and one diplomat. One third of this military uh, are, are holding positions linked to, uh, one third of the members of the Politburo that are military are holding positions that are linked to national security, not to political positions. And they were there. The majority of the military that are members of the Politburo were there before Raul Castro and before the Sixth Congress. Only one military joined the Politburo at the Sixth Congress. The two new members that joined the Politburo at the Sixth Congress are were civilians. The Secretariat. The Secretariat of the Communist Party has seven members. They are all civilians. And there's a variety of professions. There are doctors, economists, uh, lawyers, political scientists. The Council of Ministers, which is a, a very important, of course, part of the government, is the backbone of the government. Uh, it, it, it's, the, it's, it's the body that, that, that rules the country, that runs the country on a day-by-day -day basis. Well, there are 17 per, 17 percent of the Council of Ministers, of the 32 members of the Council of Ministers are military. But only six military are in positions that are not linked to national security. Of this, of the new military, of these six appointed in uh, positions that are not linked to national security, only three have been appointed by Raul Castro. Almost all members of the council were appointed by Raul, and the majority of them are civilians. As a matter of fact, the key positions, with only a few exceptions, a very few exceptions, the key positions in the, in the uh, economic section of the council uh, is, uh, are held by civilians. The vice president in charge of reforms the foreign trade, foreign investment, tourism, agriculture, the central bank, finances, uh, industry, uh, administrative control, justice, foreign relations, and of course, health and education. The majority of the Council of Ministers, the profession that is represented, the highest Possession, profession in the Council of Ministers and the Cuban government are engineers and economists. 46% of the Council of Ministers are, of the Council of Ministers are engineers, and 25% are economists. That that makes a total of 71% of economists and engineers. Well, if we if we look at the provincial leadership, I think. General secretaries of the first secretaries of the Communist Party and in every province, uh, we found we find no military. They are all civilians, and there's a high percentage of engineers and economists, but there's also a very high percentage of teachers, 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 high school teachers. Well, in terms of age, gender, and skin color, I'm going to finish with this. Uh, in general, we could we, we could find that at the top, 
at the top top, we could find more senior white male, and at the second level, at the second rank, uh, more youth, women, and blacks. Uh, this representation, this percentage, are very close to uh, the Cuban population. If we look at the members of the Communist Party, which are like three quarters of a million, over 700,000 members of the Communist Party of Cuba, uh, they, they are, they are uh, age structure and their gender and their uh, uh, skin color are very, very similar to the Cuban population. Uh, the, the age, the average age of the Politburo is 76, and there's only one woman. Uh, the average age of the Secretariat is 65, and there's only one woman. Uh, uh, the, cent the, co the Central Committee of the Communist Party average age is 57. They are 114 members. 42% of them are women, which is a very high percentage. The Council of Ministers by Presidents, the majority of them, all of them have over 50 years old, and some of them have over 70 years old. The Council of Ministers age, uh, average age, is 59. Only eight members of the Council of Ministers are, are below 50 years old. And there is, a, there is a, comparatively speaking, high percentage of women in the Council of Ministers, over 25%. Uh, the leadership, the, the, Cuba, the, the political leadership in, in Cuban provinces is 40 uh, years old as an average, and this is basically the, uh, the level, the, the, the power structure in which uh, we can find uh, uh, the younger uh, and, the, and the high percentage of uh, women, which is uh, 37 point five percent. Well, uh, I am running, I ran out of time already. Uh, I, I just uh, wanted to add that the list of problems, the list of policies, and the characteristics of the leaderships are exactly mirroring the transition. It's a typical transition situation. And I I want to finish by stressing the importance of what, to me, is the main goal of the uh, Cuban government policies today and the main goal of the updating uh, socialism uh, strategy, which is the recreation, the, the uh, uh, strengthening and the achievement of a new institutional system. To say the, the, the question of the institutionalized, institutionalize the system, reinstitutionalize the system, the system and make the system work institutionally is to me a key question from the viewpoint of the political agenda. Thank you very much. First, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to join this panel. I'm especially honored to be on a panel that includes so many accomplished scholars and observers of Cuban society who have been observing Cuba and studying Cuba for much longer than I have. Um, given the large amount of factual information that the other panelists are providing, and also the fact that I am a political theorist by training, and that's um, why I'm interested in Cuba, my comments today will largely be theoretical and related to questions uh, about how to think about Cuban socialist ideology, specifically what kinds of frameworks and concepts illuminate transformations of Cuban socialist ideology and move beyond some of the binary oppositions that contribute to deadlock in discussions about Cuba and also fail to capture some of the less obvious ways that reality is theorized in Cuba. The experience is made sense of. So the following, and this is sort of ripping on uh, 
Rafael Hernandez's list of uh, political common sense. I'm going to provide some examples of assumptions that dominate, that I think dominate discussions of Cuba and can occlude understanding how Cuban socialist ideology is negotiated and articulated as opposed to always contradicted or affirmed. One, the fetishization of civil society as a realm of opposition. This is done by the Cuban government, by the, sorry, by the US government, and at times by the Cuban government itself, right? So when it is not defining civil society as mass organizations, it is defining civil society as a realm of opposition as well. The corollary to this is the idea that civil society is either A, a space of truly expressed non-socialist ideas, a truly political realm, versus the realm of the state as a realm of ideology, um, whereas in fact, of course, ideology is operating everywhere, which is an obvious point. We all know that. And yet, when it comes to talking about Cuba, so that sort of gets forgotten for some reason. Um, or, right? The other idea of civil society is a space, a space entirely at the service of foreign powers, right, which is the Cuban state's understanding. In the first case, civil society is valorized because of what it opposes, socialism, rather than because civil society is understood always as a site of political participation that makes demands upon and challenges the state. Once opposition is fetishized in this way, the degree to which groups opposed to the state exist and operate is the measure of civil society rather than the diversity of actors within political society, and I say political society, and the degree to which groups represent the concerns of people within Cuban society and work to achieve certain goals. The risk of focusing on the opposition between state and civil society is that the issues of sovereignty and ideology fall by the wayside, right? So issues of sovereignty as in all state, issues that all states have to deal with, not just the Cuban state, fall by the wayside in, name of, in the name of accessing which side, assessing which side of the state civil society relationship wins out. Another common assumption is the frequent juxtaposition of ideology to reality or ideology to pragmatism, the idea that socialist ideology in Cuba serves only to blind the leadership from what needs to be done or to serve their own interests with staying in power. And this ignores that ideology always functions to give meaning to the world around us. Another is the idea that Cubans outside the leadership are a monolithic group, right? What do Cubans think? What is the Cuban response? Um, and I admit I fall prey to this, right? Cubans. Um, right? Even the idea of Cuban youth or Cuban professionals as a monolithic group. Instead, we might, it might be better to think about different positions within Cuban society and that certain positions are more frequently adopted by certain groups. Another is the constant characterization of Cuba as in transition, as in crisis, right? as, uh, um, as always on the verge of change is always on the verge of heading towards liberal democracy and nothing else counts. And this, of course, ignores the myriad ways in which Cuba is not on this path, not just because the leadership is wary of it, but because others within Cuban society are as well. It also simply ignores history and the fact that many of the issues that appear to be new challenges to the Cuban state or to Cuban socialist ide ideology are in fact old and not even specific to Cuba. For instance, balancing growth with equity. Finally, the assumption, well, not finally, there's a few more, assumption that Cuban social ideology is static, fixed, ahistorical, or conversely, that it changes according to the whims of the Cuban leadership. The corollary assumption that the Cuban state has a monopoly on Cuban socialist ideology. And finally, the idea that change is always top down, but simultaneously that resistance to economic liberalization is always found among bureaucratic elites versus a Cuban population eager for free market capitalism. I think there's many examples of uh, Cubans resisting liberalization. Of course, not all, but for instance, uh, especially people who are more dependent upon the Cuban social welfare, welfare state, so nervous about uh, the possibility of getting rid of La Breda, the Libreta, um, uh, resistance <laughs> to taxation, to cutting jobs, um, right? And even people who claim to be opposition will talk about this, the state not providing what it should which is kind of an interesting example of the extent to which ideology, socialist ideology, is permeated, has become hegemonic. That even the opposition complains that the Cuban state is, is cheating them. Right? Or the local bakery is not, didn't give them bread, and so they give them the double bread the next day, and they say, you can't fool me. Right? That, they owe, owe that to me. So in, in order to better see the different ways that socialist ideology is articulated, it might be better to understand socialist ideology as a set of interrelated, interrelated principles, including socioeconomic equality, inclusive nationalism, and political unity. 
Understanding socialist ideology in this way as principles allows us to consider it not as static dogma imposed by the Cuban leadership, but as something negotiated by that Cuban leadership, but also as living, living, an ideology is living in the sense that people think about it, and lived as in that it's not just imposed, it's not just lived because of specific policies, but it has some relationship to people's daily life. Um, now, rather focusing on the state versus civil society opposition to understand Cuban socialist ideology, it might be better to consider relations between a variety of different spheres of Cuban society, all of which have public and private aspects to them, and which at times overlap and at times are distinct. The overlap can be due to a variety of factors. Some actors occupy more than one sphere. Academics and some officials, especially lower level officials, also operate in the popular sphere. Those in the popular sphere must also negotiate state institutions, including bureaucracies and schools. How everybody talks about Cuban socialism amongst their neighbors is different than how they speak in academic or government settings. This distinction, however, cannot be simply reduced to opportunism or fear, but also to the different demands of these different spheres. No one sphere can be said to be more political than the others. Rather, it's that different kinds of politics operate in each. Ideology is always situated in the sense that it is created and recreated in light of specific political problems posed within different spheres that escape the state civil society categorization. In Cuba, while the state has often the last word in the form of laws, it has not in the form of laws, that's the way in which it asserts its last word, right? It makes the laws. It has not always had the first. While the state disciplines, and this is most clearly seen in the case of dissidents on the island, it is also a participant in a larger discussion. Some articulations of Cuban socialism within other spheres of Cuban society escape state control, but this does not mean that these other articulations represent the true version of socialism in opposition to the state, again, right, because the state has to operate according to certain rules and, and, and considerations that other spheres do not. In other words, one misses much of the story of the negotiation of Cuban socialism in Cuba if one frames this discussion always in terms of the state control versus freely expressed ideas. Again, while the state may have the last word on Cuban socialism because it ultimately determines what policies to implement, it does not have either the first or the last word on Cuban socialist ideology. <laughs> How much time? Oh, six minutes. Oh, great. Okay, so I'm going to end this very, I, I understand, very abstract theoretical discussion um, <laughs> with um, some admittedly cursory observations from my last trip back to Cuba in the spring of 2011. I was there for six weeks, right around the time of the Six-Party Congress. And specifically, I want to look at Cuban socialist ideology via a specific local site within Cuba. And so again, to really focus on specific moments of its negotiation. And this is at a Cuban mall in Havana, to which I have returned frequently over the years not to go shopping, uh, but always to look at how, to look at the advertising in this mall uh, and to see how that advertising is related to the revolutionary project. It's the Carlos III Mall in, in Havana, if anybody been there. So the first time I was there in 2000, uh, following a variety of cautious reforms probably everyone's familiar with, uh, meant to pull the country out of the economic freefall provoked by the collapse of the Soviet Union. The mall itself symbolized many of the contradictions that had emerged in Cuban socialist uh, society. Following the collapse, uh, the difference between the dollar and peso economy, the privileges of those with access to dollars. Um, and in the entrance to the mall, there was a sign that read sales plus economy plus efficiency equals re revolution. And the sign to me was illustri illustrative of the way that the Cuban leadership was dealing with or justifying ideologically those changes that had taken place. Members of the Cuban leadership, right, the now disgraced Carlos Laje, presented the eco economic reforms as necessary ills, as a bitter pill that had to be swallowed in order to preserve the achievements of the revolution. Now, jump ahead. Um, now, well, one of the problem. Oh, no, okay, I have time. Um, now, if sales plus economy plus efficiency equaled revolution, uh, uh, revolution was understood simply as the provision of social social services in a society that was less egalitarian than it had been, and this ran the risk of reducing Cuban socialism to the welfare state, or worse yet, to shopping. In contrast to this, I found uh, that popular responses, particularly within the realm of the arts and culture and music, uh, 
we expressed concern about this cons with this consumerist turn. Now jump ahead, another flash moment. January 2007, the same place, Carlos III, the, the slogan, sales plus economy plus efficiency is gone, and has been replaced with a much lengthier and moralizing description of what revolution was, taken from a May 1st, 2000 speech of Fidel Castro, of course, actually at the same time that the sales plus economy plus efficiency slogan had appeared. And this read, revolution is an awareness of historic moments. It is changing everything that must be changed. It is full of quality and liberty is to be treated and to treat everyone as a man. On and on and on. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, but the point is that by 2007, the snappy slogans which revolu where revolution was reduced to a mathematical equation was replaced by a labored and detailed description of all the moral virtues of revolution. Rather than try and reconcile the moral culture with revolution, the signs now serve to remind shoppers of that original other revolution of Martí and Fidel. One could shop but thinking always of one's revolutionary principles. Now fast forward again, May 2011, and it seems as if attempts to link the word revolution to the experience of being at Carlos III have been abandoned entirely. The entranceway has no signs about the meaning of revolution or bust of Martí. All it has is a giant photo of the Cuban national baseball team, and then further into the entrance, a large yellow sign for Western Union, to whose offices the amount of remittances from the United States has increased with Obama's election. Um, hanging banners celebrated Mother's Day and a large electronic sign at one end of the mall flashed images of Visa and MasterCard and then Hirong, 50 años de la Victoria, followed by an invitation to visit the stores of Carlos III and information about what items were available for sale. Spices, condiments, blah, blah, blah. Thus, in this case, there was neither an attempt to link ideology to practice as in 2000 or to simply remind people of this original socialist ideology. Um, the only political sign have a hug above the food court and exhorted people a trabajar duro, which referred to Raul Castro, uh, the words that Raul Castro had used to end the address of the Six Party Congress held the previous month, in which the uh, leadership had outlined its new economic plan. Efficiency played an important role, but so did work itself. There were no references to Che, but the message resonated with his insistence Cubans must work hard and must do so thinking not just in the immediate satisfaction of material e needs. Indeed, Raul ended the Fourth Congress of the Union of Young Communists in April 2010, insisting that the economic battle today consists more than ever the principal task and the focus of the ideological work of the cadres because on the economy depends the sustainability and preservation of our social system. Um, that's why I think the, the, it's significant, and I realize this is a kind of speculation, but I think it is significant that there is no tem attempt to even link what's going on in the mall to socialist ideology, ideology. I think this says something about, yes, in fact, there is something, even though there's always the cry of Cuban transition, Cuban crisis, that this is, in fact, a significant shift. At the same time, there is an echo back to previous debates within social ideology about the meaning of work within a socialist society. Okay, one last comment. By, the, um, by 2011, the contrast between the merchandise available at Carlos III and outside was less stark. Cuba looked more, to me, like a Latin Ameri other Latin American countries. Apartment entrances now house Puente Propista, selling a wide range of items, including CDs, plumbing parts, and clothing. Thus, it seemed even more so than in the 1990s that the Cuban leadership was encouraging a liberal or neoliberal definition of civil society, right? that the kinds of activities that were allowed in civil society were economic activities rather than political ones. Um, and this is echoing a concern articulated most consistently and, and eloquently by Araldo Dia um, about the importance of having marketization accompanied by political, political pluralization in order to ensure that at least some elements of socialism can survive uh, as, this, as the state itself distances itself from socialism and from ideolo socialist ideology, which seems to be what is distinct about these latest changes. Um, now I want to just end and I'm saying that, that I think the transformation of the public realm into the realm of buying and selling is worrisome not just for socialism but for democracy right? and not necessarily in its liberal form. And finally, I don't think that mercantile capitalism, which is the buying and selling uh, of goods, can hardly be a long-term solution to Cuba's economic woes. Thank you. Oh, you go there.
thank you very much for the, to the organizers of this conference for this generous invitation to be in this panel. Uh, I, I am very glad that I come after the presentation of Catherine, the presentation of Rafael, and the wonderful presentations in the morning. Uh, the problem when you are in this uh, moment is that you basically have to say like the actress Shasha Gabor, that when she was marrying for the eighth time, she said that she knew what she was doing, but she was not sure how to make it interesting. <laughs> so uh, the, topic of my, the, topic, the topic of my presentation is uh, uh, similar to the one that Rafael clearly stated, is the political dimension of the changes that are taking place in Cuba since Raul Castro ascended to the presidency. I will present uh, three main issues uh, uh, that, that are the following. The context in which those changes are taking place, because I think that circumstances are very important to understand what is happening. Second, I will make some references to the processes of economic reform, basically the political implications of the process of economic reform and a process of political liberalization. And I was planning, I'm not sure I will have time to do it, to touch on the implication of those processes in terms of challenges and opportunities for US policy towards Cuba. I covered all this in a, in a paper that I wrote like a year ago. It's called Change in Post-Fidel Cuba. And it's at the website of the New America Foundation. So if any of you would like to go deeper or, or learn a little uh, deeper of what I covered there, then you can uh, go uh, to the website of the New America Foundation and Google Change in Post-Fidel Cuba. Uh, the title is Change in Post-Fidel Cuba, Economic Reform and Political Liberalization, Implications for US Policy, and it's there. So uh, let me begin by, you know, I think that we begin by the third slide, not for the, not by the first one. Yeah, so let, let, me, let me begin by, uh, I have done in parallel, I didn't know that, that Rafael was doing uh, this, but I, I basically, uh, did uh, I, I, I uh, gathered all the data about age, the, all the data that I could that I could gather about age, race, level of education, age, uh, age uh, uh, of of the five the same five organs that um, Rafael was doing, and I'm currently adding the members of the central committees. Of, of the provincial committees of the communist parties in every province. So something that we need to take into account is uh, in the graph, what you see is the structure of the elites. Those that are unknown were mistakes that I made because I was filling the data and I, for, I forgot to put male or female. And uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, now I have to go over more than 700 names and find which was the one that I forget. But I'm going to do it later. But I didn't want to lose the opportunity to present it here. And this is basically the structure uh, by gender. What you see the data down is the general population. And you see that in some sense, it's not, not completely obviously that you can claim that there are some gender, some female underrepresentation in the structures of the elite. But this is something that is quite typical in almost every country. Uh, but in the case of Cuba, it's interesting that if you look at the historical picture, there is a significant improvement for the women representation at the levels of the elites. Uh, second, you see the structure of age. And in this uh, uh, bar graph, again, you have the elite structure at the graph and then you have the uh, structure of the population uh, in, the, in, the, in this part here. Uh, this, is, this is quite interesting because it touched uh, of some of the ideas that Rafael mentioned about the leadership and the, the areas in which there are successors or not. As you see, there is a kind of end shape uh, between the ages of 40 and 70, and a big 
problem is the generation on the 60s. That are from 60 to 70, there is a big drop in the uh, people that are uh, members of, of these institutions. The, uh, the, the structure, the age structure of the population is, down, is below. Notice that uh, the median age in Cuba is 38.9, uh, according to the data of 2010. Uh, life expectancy is 77.8, more than 80 for women. And uh, as, as you will see, there are uh, some type of overlapping between the structures of the lead and the way the population is uh, uh, moving. Uh, then let me go to the final. Uh, I basically tried to identify the race through the pictures. That was quite difficult sometimes because you are not sure if the person is a mulatto, according to the Cuban. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, this, is, this is harder. So you will see a, a biggest uh, unknown uh, group there. But it's, it's interesting uh, the way it's uh, moving and the representation that uh, uh, blacks and mulattoes are having in the, in the structure. Uh, in terms of uh, education, this is, this is all what I, I'm going to present uh, uh, there. In terms of education, uh, Rafael, I found basically the same data. Uh, the, the prevalence of engineers and economists at, and military at the upper echelon. At the same time, you see that the provincial level is full of people with experience in education, primary, secondary, and high school education that are transferred to the party apparatus. They work there as what they call an instructor, basically a party instructor. And they basically go uh, step by step in the scale of the, of the party. Uh, it's very important here to also look at the armed forces, because if you see at the uh, renewal of the elites in the armed forces, the process of intergenerational transition has already happened. You see that all the main military commands, the Eastern, the Western, the Central Army, are on the generals that are between 50 and 55. So there is no question about that. And the, uh, the Minister of the Armed Forces, General uh, Leopoldo Sintra Frias, is in uh, his uh, um, late 60s, early 70s. And I don't remember exactly his age now, but the second man, that is Alvaro Lopez Miera, he was 13 in 19, uh, 14 in 1959. You basically can make the calculus, but he's on his uh, 60s. Uh, part of, uh, another element of the context in which the reforms are taking place is the particular relationship with the Cuban-American community or the Cubans living abroad. Uh, this year, according to some data, uh, there were close to 400,000 family trips to the island. So the, the link between Cuba and those Q and the Cubans living abroad has increased significantly. And they are a factor also shaping the, this ideological debate that Catherine uh, was mentioning. Uh, I, I want to be very clear in what I'm going to say now about the source. Uh, the, what are, according to some, I would say, hostile sources to the Cuban government, uh, what are the, the main uh, uh, concerns of the Cuban population? If you look at the Freedom House uh, survey and the IRI surveys in close to in five different provinces, in uh, the, the three main issues were basically welfare issues. People expressed that they were uh, worried about, uh, uh, or their main uh, issues priorities were. Uh, house, transportation, food, and in the second year, they, this, this has done, I think, uh, for three years now, but in the second year, they expressed uh, some uh, uh, worrisome attitude about uh, jobs. Second, freedom to travel. When people talk about uh, 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 demands, things that they would like to change in a list of rights, they talk about the uh, ability to travel. Third was the right to own private property. And this is not what the IRI say or what the Freedom House say, but let me tell you how I see it. Uh, since I am a, a speaking to an American audience, 
When the Cubans speak, speak in Cuba about right to own private property, they use a phrase that is very typical. It's the right to own, uh, to, uh, el, el derecho a tener mi propio negocio. Notice, the right to own my own business. This is important, make this, this difference. Uh, and even the, the name Paladar that was used for private restaurant, because for the Cubans, when we discuss the right to own private property, this has nothing to do with the way the right to own private property is expressed in the helms borton law. That basically means the compensation and restitution of property to the previous owners who lost property after 1959. So I say that because Seeing from the United States uh, from the United States policy perspective, there is the possibility that Cuba progress significantly in the area of let's say right to travel or right to own private property, and still the uh, uh, conditions expressed in Health Borton will not be satisfied. So this this were the oh, oh, and, the, and the final issue of context that I think is important, and, and I'm glad that even discussing. The issue of the economy, uh, Ambassador Entwistle mm -hmm. mentioned it in the morning, and is the issue of the presence of a nationalist and a strong nationalist culture. Something that I think is a major uh, misunderstanding about the Cuban Revolution is that the Cuban Revolution had a dual character from the beginning. It was at the same time, uh, in the minds of the main leaders, the, what the, what the so called Kohimar group. It was a socialist revolution with strong communist leanings, but also it was a nationalist revolution embedded in the authoritarian political culture of the 20th century Cuba. And this is very important because there is a tremendous reservoir of legitimacy always associated to this nationalist narrative. And it's important when you discuss almost everything in the Cuban context. So let me discuss a little about the, the two processes. Uh, the process of economic reform, I would basically define it as a, a, a process that includes two major dimensions. First, a process of marketization, or a transition to an economy in which the role of the market is an integral part of the new model. And uh, here we need to understand that there is a, a, a transition that is a long transition. It didn't begin necessarily with Raul. Although I will agree that Fidel never expressed any type of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, ben benign acqu acquiescence to the adoption of market mechanism. But Cuba moved from a command economy, a typical command economy, until 1992, and with the reforms of 1992 and the reforms between 92 and 96, Cuba become a command economy, opening a small segment that at some point got 160,000 uh, self-employed workers around 2006, but by the data that I have seen. It was a, 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 a market-oriented segment, but this mar market-oriented segment was conceived as a concession to uh, the, the crisis situation, as Paolo mentioned it today. And the goal, was to put a wall, the, the goal was to put a wall around this market-driven sector uh, to avoid the contagion of its political implications to the rest of the economy. I think that now we are talking about, when, when Julia mentioned today in the morning, a mixed economy, I think it's a better definition. The government is trying to integrate its beginning to approach to the economic problems seen from an integral point of view that include, includes important connection between the state sector and the non-state sector in the project of a transition to uh, an economy that will have close to 40, sometimes the, uh, Esteban Lasso mentioned even half of the size of the labor force employed in the non-state sector. Uh, uh, that, that I would say the marketization element is, 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 is an important part. The second is a decentralization process. It's a decentralization process at the level of the economy and also at the level of the regulatory uh, framework that deal with the type of reforms that are taking place. 
All this obviously has a tremendous political implications and challenges. I, taking advantage of what was discussed in the morning, I will simply point out three that, in my view, are an important challenge for the, uh, the, 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 the public policy discussion. Uh, first is the issue of the potential overlapping of differences of class, race, and region. And this can create situations that could be tense as part of the uh, political, uh, of the economic reform. Uh, second, that decentralization could represent also a decentralization of corruption. And basically, I think that the authorities has been clear on a timing and sequence of changes that put an emphasis on having a, an anti-corruption agency or creating a strong anti-corruption agency early on the reform. Uh, the, the creation of wage gaps between the state sector and the market-oriented ones. And uh, uh, finally, with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the migratory reform, uh, uh, the issue of a potential brain drain. Uh, I, th I think this is, this is the, the main issue on economic reform. Let me go briefly to the liberalization, political liberalization process, and I will end there. Uh, here, the essence of the process of, of political liberalization is a less vertical type of state-society relations. Uh, this is not reduced to the marketization process. Uh, I think that uh, as part of the redefinition of the role of the party and the state in the Cuban in, in, and its relationship with Cuban society, what we see is a, a transition to a post-totalitarian uh, regime in which the most authoritarian structures are basically uh, uh, overcome. And uh, we see an institutionalization of the power of the party versus the type of charismatic leadership that Fidel used to have. And here, an important element is the issue of term limits. Uh, decentralization is a very political process. It's not only economic. Uh, obviously, it, it, it represents a major challenge because it, 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 it uh, implies a transference of power from the center to the provinces and to the municipalities. And we have seen the emergence of a new type of relationship between uh, religious communities and uh, the government. Here, I would like to connect my, my views with something that Catherine point out early. In the analysis of this process of liberalization, it's more, even more important to take into account the separation between what is called political society and what is called civil society. Something that I think is, is, is going uh, uh, quite clear is that the government is ready to uh, uh, establish an, a, 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 a dialogue I will not call it a negotiation, but in some sense, always there is some bargaining there between the interest of some non-partisan or non-political autonomous civil organizations, like the Catholic Church is one of them, while at the same time having a very uh, strong uh, rejection of any type of negotiation or recognition or, of those groups that pretend to compete for political power uh, with the party. So I'm going to uh, uh, leave it there. And uh, I, I look forward to your questions uh, in, the, in the session. Uh, being an old man, I'm going to remain seated uh, as I give my uh, brief presentation. Uh, look. Uh, I am reasonably confident uh, that Cuba is moving in the right, in the right direction. Slowly, perhaps, uh, obstacles to overcome and so forth. But I think uh, that they have come to a realization that there must be change, uh, some very basic change and are moving slowly, perhaps, uh, stops and starts, 
but moving in that, uh, in that direction. So I'm relatively optimistic about the future uh, of Cuba. I'm not at all optimistic about the future of U.S.-Cuban relations. Well, I say the future of U.S.-Cuban relations. Relations will continue to exist, but there's going to be, I think, some very, uh, well, maybe not dramatic, but there's going to be uh, change. We're not going to have the same kind of system that we had in the past. Maybe that's good. In fact, I, I think it, it, probably, it probably is, but uh, why not? Why am I not optimistic about the future of U.S.-Cuban US -Cuban relations? Well, uh, look, uh, I've said uh, from time to time that uh, Cuba seems to have the same effect on American administrations that the full moon once had on werewolves. And we, we just don't seem to be able to deal rationally with Cuba. Look, I, you know, I've been, uh, and I must confess, probably another reason for my pessimism is that I've been involved in this so long uh, without any uh, reason to be optimistic. Uh, as we were breaking relations with Cuba, as getting on the boat to steam out of Havana Harbor, I remember saying, I'll be vowing to myself I would be with the first group of American diplomats back into Cuba, and thinking it might be, you know, a couple of years. Well, 16 years later, I was with the first group of American diplomats back in. I was there for a time uh, under Jimmy Carter, and uh, then along came Ronald Reagan, and it was clear that there was not going to be any positive change in our relationship with Cuba, quite the contrary. And so I sent in my cable asking him to be removed from the post and given a job unrelated to policy until such time as I could take early retirement. Uh, uh, but vowing, again, vowing to myself, I wouldn't really retire to that sailboat and start around the world until there were normal relations with Cuba. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was 30 years ago. And as we, as we now enter perhaps the second administration of Obama, I don't see any grounds for real optimism. It could happen after the elections, perhaps, but one must have uh, one must have one's. Uh, reservations. I think that there was a time uh, with 9-11. Uh, you know, uh, we have the attack uh, against the United States. Uh, virtually every nation in the world, virtually every nation, there were a few, but virtually every nation in the world was with us. Even Cuba. Cuba indicated that it was leaving its skies open. American planes could land. It was signing all the UN anti-terrorist uh, protocols uh, and made every gesture to indicate that it would support the United States. And uh, what did uh, George Bush do? He rejected all that. Uh, uh, said we didn't, didn't want to have anything to do with Cuba. And for the next eight years, uh, we didn't negotiate uh, with Cuba. We had been, but now we stopped. Uh, Bush made it clear that our objective was to bring down the Castro government. It was nothing less than that. Uh, well, George Bush, one have to, one must admit, George Bush, was, yes, uh, probably the worst president we ever had. Uh, so one must excuse him, I suppose. But nonetheless, it, uh, nonetheless it, 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 left, it did leave a certain flavor, a certain bad taste in the mouth of the, uh, of the Cubans. Then in comes uh, Barack Obama. And uh, there was a hope, expectation, uh, that he would bring about change with Cuba. Well, let me, let me put as an aside that, uh, as an aside, that uh, 
he did bring about other change. Uh, it, it was a much better administration than we had had. Uh, yes, there were very there were there were positive things about it, but the relationship with Cuba was not really uh, one of them. All we uh, opened up a bit to travel, uh, but very very little. He he did he did very little to bring about positive change uh, with with Cuba. Uh, the and, and still has not. Uh, quite, uh, quite the contrary. Some of his recent moves have been not at all, not at all helpful. Uh, the United States at this point, uh, the image of the United States uh, in the rest of the world, uh, when it comes to Cuba, is the lowest. I would say the lowest it has ever been. Perhaps, uh, uh, well, okay, maybe not as low as under George Bush, but almost, but almost. Uh, our, our standing, we don't have any support in the world for our position. Quite the contrary, as I think uh, uh, Kirby Jones was pointing out and Julia Swig uh, in the morning, uh, the United States is virtually isolated. There was a time when you know, we had isolated Cuba. Uh, now it's the other way around. Now uh, the United States uh, has no support at all for its policy towards Cuba. <laughs> we, every year uh, our embargo is denounced uh, in the United Nations General Assembly. Oh, there, uh, one country always votes with us, of course, that's Israel. But Israel trades with Cuba. It's one of the most active traders. They vote, they vote with us and, and then make money on, on the Cuba. So good, I guess. Uh, but we, we simply have no support. And at this latest uh, inter-American meeting, uh, our isolation took on an even more uh, active form uh, the president of Colombia. Colombia has in the past been, you know, a close ally of ours, and, and especially on something like Cuba. But now Santos uh, made it clear, unless Cuba is included in the next session, there will be no next session because none of us will come. None of the other countries, none of the other Latin American countries will come. So we are, we are on the issue of Cuba, we are now isolated, and why? What do we gain from this? As a number of people have said, Julia, Arturo, uh, Kirby Jones, and, and several others, we gain nothing from this. Uh, the, the embargo isn't really hurting Cuba. And Cuba gets along fine with, uh, with it in place. Uh, it simply makes us look foolish. It diminishes our standing and our prestige for absolutely no gain. It is an utterly stupid policy, uh, which we should have the good sense to get rid of. Change, there's no harm done. Simply begin to talk to the Cubans. We don't have to you know, make any great gestures, uh, give them lots of money or anything. <laughs> That's the usual way, but we don't have to do that. All we have to do is say we're willing to talk. We're willing to engage. Uh, let's have a normal relationship. Uh, what's wrong with that, uh, for God's sakes? But will we do it? Well, I, uh, as I say, <laughs> been waiting for a long time, uh, some 60 years now, and uh, I haven't seen it, I haven't seen so far, haven't seen any indication that we're going to move, yeah, we're going to move in that direction now, although one can always hope. Once the elections are over and you don't have to worry about the vote anymore, uh, there's always a possibility. But the problem with me is I've seen that possibility too many times uh, with utter futility. So I'm a little skeptical now. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So questions? How can you say such things? <laughs> That's a question. So we'll pass these around. I'm going to give them to you. OK, so there are question cards being passed around. And the way it will work is people will write down their questions. And I'll read them up here. So we've got the first question. I think it's addressed to anyone in general. Do you want to come back up, Catherine? <laughs> OK. Well, let's try to write legibly. <laughs> Please. Can you read that? There have been. Okay. References to the Roman Catholic Church so far. Is there any expectation that the church will have a significant role to play in Cuba's future? Okay. There, but I didn't okay, so there have been references to the Roman Catholic Church so far. Is there any expectation that the church will have a significant role to play in Cuba's future? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, I think there will. In fact, the church has now come out with positions that uh, sort of support the, the uh, uh, stance is taken by the uh, by the government. Um, so I I think I think so. I think the Catholic Church will play uh, an important role uh, in in the future of the country. Arturo? Yeah, yeah I, I think that uh, it's important not to overestimate the role of the Catholic Church, but also not to underestimate it. Uh, the, the Catholic Church is, uh, in terms of organization, uh, autonomy, and presence in the Cuban national territory, the uh, civil society organization outside those uh, that are defined as amphibious organizations that are, has a kind of connection with the government, a more organic connection to the government, is the largest, and I would say the one, the, the one that has more capacity for collective action. That said, it's important to uh, remember that Cuba is a, a country in which formal uh, allegiance to the church is not uh, so important as in other countries in Latin America. No. But again, I go to what I said uh, in, in my presentation about the difference and complementarities between civil society and political society. Recently, there was a hearing in Congress in which uh, Congress invites some witnesses that are working with the National Endowment for Democracy. And the person who spoke was Normando Hernandez, a Cuban dissident who came to live in the United States or living in Spain. And he talked about something called the true and independent civil society. And he mentioned that we have organized 29,000 dissidents all over the island. Well, let's say if we, if we, for the sake of the argument, take this number seriously, there are 29,000 members of one or other dissident group. The church, for instance, mobilizes every Sunday between 100,000 and 125,000. Still is 1% of the Cuban population, less than 1%, but it's by far bigger than the dissidents. So uh, we have a policy towards Cuba that is betting on actors that are less relevant for the process of political liberalization, less relevant for the process of the discussion of the reform, and uh, uh, we see a continuous pattern of attack to the Catholic Church. Radio Martí, for instance, yeah. called Cardinal Ortega a lackey. And basically, the, the, the only thing worse than one bad policy Framed on Hans Borton is having two bad policy, one by the Hans Borton organs, the executive authority, and the second by the director of Radio Marti targeting the Catholic Church for promoting changes that are uh, uh, against the logic of the right wing exiles. Right. <laughs> Did you want to respond? <coughs> no, I have. Okay. I agree. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> give time for another question. All right. Um, yeah. Generally, how can you say that Cuba is not suffering under the embargo? I think that was funny. 
Cuba is not really suffering under the embargo because it can trade with every other country in the world. Uh, and the, the Cubans are very clever uh, traders. Uh, that's T-R-A-D-E-R-S. Uh, and they, they do reasonably well. The embargo is something they can use over and over again to hit us over the head if it weren't for the embargo. Uh, well, not that it has no harm at all, but it doesn't, it's not really crucial. Uh, I don't, it doesn't really hurt the, the Cubans, especially because they can trade with every other country uh, in the world. And they are now trading you know, with Brazil, uh, Canada, France, uh, no longer dependent on the, uh, on the Soviet Union uh, by, by any means. So uh, that, that's my answer. As long as you can trade with every other country in the world, the fact that you can't trade with the United States, even though it's your nearest neighbor, and the country you used to trade with uh, all the time, uh, is not going to, to bring you down. It's not going to have serious effect. Uh, uh, uh. As much as I, uh, you know, I, I generally, for me, it's a great honor to be with such an expert as, as Wayne Smith is. I disagree with the idea that the, uh, Cuba is not suffering under the embargo. Uh, I, I believe that the 10% clause that basically regulate the trade with Cuba of any product that contain 10% of American components is hurting the Cuban economy. I think it's also hurt the potential for exports. I don't think that, that, that this is uh, the main problem now, but obviously in terms of opportunity cost and potential, it is hurting Cuba. Uh, it's, it's hurting, hurting. I don't know if I know that I have accent issues. I say hurting, H U. R T U I N G. Okay. Not helping. We misunderstood. Yeah, it's hurting. It's hurting Cuba. The ten percent. I will not add a lot. I am probably this, this public, uh, this res, uh, public knows about the fact that uh, America is the biggest market in the world and Cuba is ninety miles, uh, and obviously this is a problem for the reforms. Uh, in in political terms. I am not going to quote the uh, uh, Communist Party of the Soviet Union or the Maoist Party of Nepal, but Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, they consider the embargo a violation of, Q of human rights of Americans and Cubans in its own merits, not, 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 not the effect on the human rights situation in Cuba. By in its own merits, the embargo is a violation of uh, uh, human rights. I will not uh, add more there except one issue. Uh, the reform, the economic reform that was described by Paolo today in the morning and others uh, basically talk about the expansion of a market driven sector in Cuba. So even if for the sake of the argument you accept that we have to live under the structure of the embargo the irrationality and counterproductive character of the embargo increase when the, the structures that you are blockading include not only the government economy, but also the emerging non-state sector of the Cuban economy. Okay. Let me just, let me just add, uh, not, to take, not to take issue, but... Uh, if you take issue, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm saying is it doesn't particularly hurt Cuba. It certainly hasn't hurt Cuba so much that it's forced Cuba uh, to move away and give up the measures that call on, that call on us to impose the embargo. Uh, I would love to see the embargo lifted, of course. Uh, it should be lifted. It's, uh, uh, it's dishonest. It's counterproductive. But not so counterproductive, my point is, it's not so counterproductive that it has forced the Cubans uh, to move in the other direction. It's not an effective policy tool. Yeah. Okay. California will soon have less, or California is already less than 50% white. Since Cuba has roughly a 50% black-white ratio, roughly, 
Is there a recognition that the U.S. can learn something about race relations from its Cuban neighbors? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> I'd say so, but <laughs> a recognition on the part of whom, or, or who, yeah. rec who's rec who needs to recognize? I'm just. I'm I guess uh, can the U.S. learn something from the way Cuba grapples with diversity, or? Oh. Yeah. Whoever posed the question. I, go ahead. I, I'm just going. If that's the question, I'd oh, say yes, what? obviously. Yeah. I, I think that I think that, that both societies can learn from the treatment of uh, the the racial issues in the other one. Uh, Cuba, basically, if you look at, at history, even it has a multiracial integrated army when Cubans were fighting for independence since yeah. the first independence war. And uh, it, it has done important things, let's say, uh, to in, in public education, they lock everybody in the public education system, and that was a way that they improved a lot the standard of education for what, well, in America you will call it a minority, but in Cuba is uh, half of the population. At the same time, I think that there are experiences in America as the way uh, we have dealt with uh, affirmative action, and I, I believe that in Cuba, it will be very important to try to explore or to explore possibilities of uh, uh, using uh, this, this thing. The United States also should take into account when we discuss complaints or historical claims what was the Cuban history. Because every time I have been in Cuba, for instance, and I, I go and talk with people that are on these uh, ra race-oriented groups, they basically, when we talk about American foreign policy, some of them basically say, well, now they are claiming about the injustices committed by the revolution after 1959, and there is no discussion about the historical injustices such as slavery that is a central part of the laundry list of historical injustice that if you open this Pandora box, Cubans will discuss. So I think that we need, each of uh, Cuba and the United States both need to be more conscious of their history and study the issue of race. And uh, to when I, I agree with what uh, uh, my friend Wayne said, I don't think that the embargo is the main responsible of Cuban economic problems, mm -hmm. but I say that it's, it's, it's an issue that is complicating uh, the, the process of economic reform yeah. and political liberalization. Okay, great. Um, can, can I just add one? Sure. I mean, I actually think that in some ways, both countries have a kind of dominant post-racial discourse that gets in the way of dealing with racism and issues related to race. Um, the U.S. is slightly better in recognizing race-based claims, but then I think it becomes um, being at conferences about you know, hip hop and this kind of thing. And there's a, it makes this is a, I'm editorializing, but it makes me a little nervous when there's discussions about kind of going down to Cuba to explain to Afro-Cubans to kind of raise consciousness, um, which implies that there's some you know, Cuba can learn something from the United States, uh, and I think those kinds of exchanges aren't particularly productive. Um, and in some ways, I've heard many um, Afro-Cubans say, I think the United States can learn from the United States um, in terms of recognizing, celebrating Afro-Cuban culture. Yeah. Okay. So, this question is for Catherine. Do you, thinking about the flow of American products if the embargo was ended, would this bring up about it elements of American cultural hegemony in Cuba? If the embargo was ended, would, would the flow of American products into, I mean, I think there's already tons of American products in, in Cuba, so I don't actually think they're, I don't see how that would necessarily change with the end of the embargo. Is that the question? Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. the Sorry, question. I, I don't. And then there's already so many American products going in via Would there Miami. be more cultural hegemony then? No, I don't think any more than there is now. Yeah. All, right. All right. Several people mentioned corruption, in quotes, 
Is this about bureaucratic cor corruption? Is this about the police? And when we think about corruption and Cuba, is this more so than in any other government? I, I, that's not my thing. Who? <laughs> well, uh, I know we had, uh, you want me to answer? Oh. Yeah, I don't think there's any greater corruption in Cuba than there is in many other states, maybe even including uh, the United States. But there is some corruption. Yes, there is. And it's something that has to be taken into account. I mean, we don't want to give the impression that Cuba is without uh, any corruption, without crime. It isn't. Uh, neither are we. So let's take it as a balance. I, I think that Cuba has typical patterns of corruption of command economies that come from the time when Cuba was a command economy. And now that there is a transition to a mixed economy, there is a potential uh, for rent-seeking opportunities for many people there. And I think that the lack of transparency uh, uh, that, that is associated with the, the type of regime that Cuba has and also the national security logic that is used to uh, hide some information is uh, an area in which we should uh, monitor. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, if you read the most recent work on corruption by, for instance, Dan Ariely, the professor at Duke University, he put a lot of emphasis in the petite corruption that is important in capitalist countries, in command economies, and Cuba basically has to, in my view, has to uh, look at these issues uh, in a second phase. Currently, it was very important, and I think uh, uh, it's coherent with the best studies about transitions, including the study uh, about transition and economics by Dr. Gerard Roland from Berkeley, that say that in the timing and sequence, of a transition to a market economy, one of the first steps should be to create a strong anti-corruption agency. And this is something that they did when they create uh, the general controller. OK. So the last question. Isn't US policy towards Cuba actually rational? Doesn't the US want to crush Cuba so as to show the consequences of defying the, quote, free world? <laughs> well, I don't think it's rational because it doesn't work. You know, for God's sakes, uh, we've been at this now for, well, uh, a long, long time, 50 years uh, or 30 years as, as things stand now. It hasn't worked. Uh, we've come to the point uh, where, as I was saying, we are the ones who are isolated. We don't have any support. We don't have any allies in the world for this policy towards Cuba. So is that rational? Can that really be rational? It's not working. We don't have any support for it. Uh, what's the point? Uh, I, I have a rather long answer. Uh, because I think, I mean, I think it is rational. I think you could say it is rational in the sense that I do think that Cuba represents an ideological threat. Uh, and what I mean by that, I'm gonna, I don't want to take too much time, but I think not just, I don't mean an ideological threat in the argument that you hear, oh, they're afraid to see that we're doing everything, you know, they're afraid of our, of our successes, and if they, you know, if we were allowed to thrive, the world would crumble and fall under, uh, fall under communism once again or something, but, but rather that an ideological threat in the sense of Cuba's kind of, ex excitable speech. It's uh, the way in which it interacts in the international realm in terms of um, exposing or demystifying liberal claims to represent the universal interest and hegemony and that kind of thing. And so I think it, it represents an ideological threat and it's un constant unmasking of the ideological. But that's sort of, yeah. I, I think that our policy towards Cuba was very well defined by Pope John Paul II, when he called it unethical, illegal, and counterproductive. That said, I would say there is a rationality there. Let me, let me make clear what, is, what I found irrational. It's not rational from a foreign policy perspective. I uh, identify with, with the liberal values of, of our democracy. I believe in, in, the, in a paradigm of a welfare, a liberal democratic welfare state. And I think that, that America, as an ideal, 
uh, has this. So I consider that our policy towards Cuba is not good for our economic interests, is not good for our strategic interests, our alliance in the hemisphere, our di di the dialogue with all the countries of the hemisphere. So it's not good for our interests, it's not good for our values, but it's uh, rational from, uh, it has been rational. I'm not sure it will be rational in the, in the next future. It has been rational for those who want to win the state of Florida, that has been a swing state in several uh, uh, elections. Let me finish by reminding you that the last Angus rate survey showed that, this is a, right, a difficult word for me to say, show, S-H-O-W, to show, the survey shows that 57% uh, of the Cuban American community oppose any restriction on Cuban American family travel and 64% opposed to any restriction of any kind of travel for any American citizen. Okay. So uh, it's something that we see trends there, and there is an opportunity. In my uh, view, uh, Cuba can alter this uh, rationality, making higher the stakes of what Minister, Minister Bruno Rodriguez, the Minister of Foreign Relations of Cuba, mentioned last week when he talked about a market of 11 million. If the Cuban economic reform proceed, and it's clear that the market of 11 million is not a potential demand, but a real effective demand for American products and trade and opportunities, I believe that it will open the appetites of important sectors in the United States enough to break the backbone of the pro-embargo lobby. Yeah. So I think that uh, uh, this is an important element. And second, any opening to participation of Cubans living overseas. I'm not mentioning Cuban Americans, because even if Cuba opens, the American government will have the issue with the embargo, so they will not be able to invest openly in Cuba. But if something like that opens, I don't think that the Cuban American pro-embargo lobby has the backbone to fight with a mobilized American constituency. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. Huh.